Good morning. Welcome to worship. Sing it out. Wonderful, so wonderful is your unfailing love. Your cross is full. This morning that he is the beautiful one Amen. I wonder how many times or how you may be this morning even describe who Jesus is is he based on what kind of week you've had whether it's been a good week or a bad week this song just told us that he is the beautiful one he is wonderful he's mighty he's powerful he's glorious he's marvelous and yet he's so much more than that Looking back to Easter, we think about what he did for each one of us on the cross, that he shed his blood for us. That gives us strength to go day by day and carry on and do what he has called us each to do. Scripture this morning found in Isaiah 40, 31 that gives us strength that says, have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. This is the word of the Lord.
that with us. It reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. The one that gives me strength from Aren't you glad that the blood that Jesus shed Amen. is good for whatever ails you this morning? Amen? Amen? I'm glad that's the case. Play that for us, Brett. And it's that blood that gave us the strength to walk out of that grave that we were in. Amen? Sing this with us. I was buried beneath my shame.
Sweet. 
may be seated. You know, when I sing songs like that, like the blood will never lose its power, and I walked out of my grave because you called me, and everything that I need is found in Jesus Christ. When I sing like songs like that, I have one reaction. Sing this with me. Thank you for, for the cross, Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the to pray for Southern Nazarene University. This is SNU Sunday across this region. When I say region, I'm talking a four state area of Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Arkansas. All Nazarene churches in those four states support higher education in the Church of the Nazarene, and we support specifically Southern Nazarene. We have a new president, and uh, Dr. Keith Newman took office last summer 
and is giving wonderful leadership and guidance and a breath of fresh air into our university. In fact, we have a video that uh, features him, and I'd like for you to watch that with me, please. <clears throat> Character, culture, and Christ have been the motto for Southern Nazarene University for many, many years. When I came as president, uh, I was really curious about those words and really curious to dig into the archives. In fact, a conversation on campus uh, one day with a visitor to our campus who asked that same question, what does character, culture, and Christ mean today? These days I like to talk about refining character. I think that uh, we're all in process. and. In those collegiate years, those years of a university experience, there's a great opportunity to refine character. And then creating culture. Certainly when we graduate students, they go out and they create culture in classrooms. They create culture in churches. They create culture uh, anywhere they go. Last but certainly not least, in fact, I would put it uh, first, and that is serving Christ. I like the fact that it's last because it does undergird everything that we do. Um, our responsibility, I believe more than anything else, is to serve our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Live Last is based on Mark, the ninth chapter, verse 35, the words of Jesus. Jesus said, if you want to be first, then you've got to be last. If you want to be successful in life, what you really have to do is to, to serve. We have the possibility and the privilege of sending out young men and young women who choose to live last. They choose to serve whether it's in a classroom or the hospital, on the mission field, in a church, whether it's in a lay position or a professional position in ministry, wherever they might go, they do what maybe nobody else wants to do. I think that stands out. I think that's salt and light. I think that's the city set on the hill. I think that's what makes a difference in our world, and that's what I'm hoping for and praying for, and certainly what we're trying to produce at Southern Nazarene University. My hope, um, my prayer, um, my passion for our churches is that Southern Nazarene University is a place that continues the discipleship work that they started in the local church. We're an extension of them and working in partnership together, I believe the possibilities are, are unlimited. A mentor of mine once said, I give you my trust, I hope to earn yours. That's what I believe for, for SMU. We trust the church. We hope that they will trust us and that we'll earn their trust and that when they send their students, their sons and their daughters, their grandsons and their granddaughters, that they will see uh, the difference that's made in a Christ-centered education. So this morning we'll be praying for Dr. Newman and for the staff and faculty and administration of our university. And I hope you keep them on your prayer list because what an important time it is to have Christian influence in higher education. And SNU does that very thing. We have a number of our friends that we're praying for and praying with, continuing to pray for Roy Frisk. Is Roy here? He said there was a chance he might try to make it. Robert, not here, okay. Well, let me tell you who is here. Marvin Wooten, stand up. <laughs> Giving thanks for God's touch on her life. I don't know many people who've had brain surgery. I know one more now than I used to two weeks ago and we're giving thanks to God for his touch on Marveen. We're praying for Pam Carlos. Pam is continuing to battle the liver count situation and keep lifting her in prayer. June Gibson had a heart cath this week and more tests are to be done. Then John McFarland had surgery last night and is in SICU at St. Bernard. Pray for he and Deb in these hours and ask God to bring healing to John's body. Then uh, our friend Betty McAnally passed away Friday night, and her husband Jay is here. Jay, we're gonna be praying for you. The service is tomorrow at two o'clock at uh, Greg Funeral Home. The visitation will be from 12 until two tomorrow afternoon prior to the service. And if any of you would like to help with a meal for them following the service, uh, you can see Sue Fernander or Kathy Buchanan. But uh, Jay, our prayers are with you and the family in these hours. 
We're also extending our sympathy to Brad Baker and his family and the loss of his aunt, Maveen Beard. There are the needs that you have personally that I encourage you to take them to the Father with confidence. He wants to hear from you and he wants to help you. Let's stand together for prayer and if you'd like to come and kneel at the front as we pray, you're welcome to come forward as we sing together. Worthy is the Lamb Father, you alone are worthy. You alone are worthy of our praise, our worship, our adoration. Before we do anything else, may we lift our praise to you. May we offer you our thanksgiving. Because if you never did another thing for us, what you've done is more than enough to deserve our praise, our worship, our thanksgiving. But Father, you've promised to be with us every day, every step of the way. So we're not worried about you stopping what you've been doing, but rather on the authority of your word, we know that you're going to continue to be with us, to never leave us or forsake us. And we give you thanks and praise, honor and glory today. We have many requests, many needs that we're praying about today. We're praying for Southern Nazarene University, for Dr. Newman, for those who, who work and serve there and for the many students who attend there. Father, may your touch, may your blessing, may your hand of protection be on each and every person connected with that university. And may you lift her up as a beacon in the darkness. May you lift her up as a place where lives are being transformed through character, culture, and Christ. Father, we pray about these who are on our prayer list. You know these who have come through surgery, some who are still looking forward to a surgery, some who are battling extended illnesses, others who have unspoken needs, all kinds of situations represented on this prayer list. And we've taken them to you in prayer today, knowing that you're not going to turn your back on any of these, but rather you welcome us into your presence You've told us we can come before you with confidence and boldness. And as we do, we can make our needs and wants known to you. Father, hear our prayer today. Hear the prayers of the congregation. Hear the prayers of us as individuals. Whatever the need may be, would you prove yourself once again to be faithful and true? to be more powerful than any situation we face. Would you remind us again, there's not anything we face that surprises you. You're aware of all of it. You know it from beginning to end, and you're ready to help us every step of the way. So whatever it is that a person may be praying about today, may they find peace in knowing they've presented the need to you, May they find comfort in knowing that you're going to help. May they find power and strength to help them endure the test, the trial, the situation. And for all that you do, for the wonderful ways that you work, for the sense of your presence that we feel in this place today, we give you thanks, praise, honor, and glory, for it's in your name we ask all of this. In the name of Jesus, amen. Sing this with us before you sit down. All we want and all we need is found in you, found in you, Jesus. Every victory is found in you, found in you. All we want and all we need is found. Ah, 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 ah. I 
before you sit down, turn to someone next to you and say, man, you are better than you sing. You may be seated. You didn't know you were coming to the land of Oz today, did you? Okay, enough of that. It is nice to have all of you today, and thank you for coming. Thank you for being part of this service, and to those of you who are worshiping with us for the first time, a special welcome to you. We appreciate, we appreciate you being here and helping out and being part of this service. If you are a first-time guest and did not have the opportunity to register as a guest, we would appreciate you taking time to put your name and information on the response form inside your, your worship folder, or you can um, take one of the information cards in the, packet, in the pocket in front of you and fill that out and put it in the offering plate, but we want to have the opportunity to make contact with you later in the week. How many of you have looked at the date on your, on your worship folder at the top? Please don't be upset with Deb. It's been a tough week. John has been in the hospital all week. But the other reason for that is we need two weeks of offering today. So we just backtrack to April 22nd again to start over again and uh, let you help us out. <laughs> I'm teasing. We, we do need a good, strong offering today to finish strong, finish our church year. Today is the last Sunday of this church year, and there are a couple of ways you can help us. If you have not participated in the mission offering, the Easter offering for World Mission, uh, we're still trying to reach that goal of $16,000. We're about $4,000 short on that. And if you have not given to that and want to give to that, or if you have given to that and God is impressing upon you to give a little more, we would appreciate that. Then just making sure that your tithes are paid up to date and making sure that if you got an income tax refund, never mind. I'll just leave it as making sure your tithe is paid up to date. You have been so faithful. You have been so generous through this past church year once again. You are examples in stewardship. And today, may you give with a heart full of cheerfulness and may you experience the peace of the Master. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give. We thank you that you made a difference in our lives that makes it possible for us to give back to you at a moment like this. Take this gift, use it, bless it, and make a difference with it all around the world. We pray in your great name. Amen. This is going to be easier to do if the ushers come and help us. <laughs> I don't remember the last time I forgot to call for the ushers to help with an offering. You guys okay with this? Let's go. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. When he told you you're not good enough when he told you you're not right when he told you you're not strong enough to put up a good fight when he told you you're not worthy when he told you you're not loved when he told you you're not beautiful you'll never be
Thank you, Lindsay. That's why the Word of God tells us over and over and over again, fear not. Paul, can I have just a little less of me? I'm not sure if it's above me or below me, but I hear way too much of me, and all the people said, yeah, I thought I'd just take that chance away from you, those of you wanting to do it. Let's go to John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, and let's stand as we read the word together. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. I, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and with, with such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. 
This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Father, we pray for your word to be heard in our hearts. We want your message to come through loud and clear today. May each one of us hear what you have to say to us in these moments together, we ask. Amen. You may be seated. It's springtime. It's the season for planting. Planting flowers, planting crops, planting whatever you want to plant in your garden. However, in some cases, like fruit-bearing trees and vines, instead of it being planting season, it's more as if it is pruning season and prepping season. For vines, it's a time for cleaning up around the, the base of the vine. Those of you who happen to grow grapes are probably aware of the information I'm about to share with you. But for the rest of us, in order to understand a little better what Jesus was talking about, we need to understand a little bit about grapevines. So in an article published by the Cooperative Extension Service, I want you to listen to some of the terminology that is used in answering the question, why prune? Okay, we're not talking prunes, the fruit. We're talking why prune the limbs, why trim the limbs, why go to such trouble, why not just let them grow? Listen. Dormant pruning is a critical component of the grape production system. It provides the mechanism to maintain the training system. It allows one to select the fruiting wood and to manipulate the potential quantity of fruit produced referring to beneficial manipulation. After a young vine has been trained and all of the permanent vine structures are developed, annual pruning should be done during the dormant season to remove the previous year's fruiting canes or spurs and the excess one-year-old canes. Because of the way grapevines grow and produce fruit, growers must prune annually. Fruit is only produced on shoots growing from one-year-old canes. Therefore, Healthy new canes must be produced every year to maintain annual production of fruit. The training system is designed to encourage the production of new fruiting canes at specific positions on the vine, the arms or the cordons. I'll be honest. Some of those words go right by me. I don't know what some of the terminology is that is supposed to be used with grapes and vineyards. But I heard some things that parallel very well with what Jesus was trying to teach that day. Words like training system, development, production, manipulation, annually. This sounds a lot like discipleship training, does it not? Those are the kind of words and the kind of terms and the kind of things that we want to see in the life of every disciple. We want to see annual growth. We want to see fruit being produced. We want to see uh, the, th the training, the development, the production take place on a regular basis. And I think we can understand why Jesus may have chosen this imagery for this lesson. It's an everyday example that many of the listeners in that day and time would have connected with very easily. So let's examine what our Lord has to say to his disciples and to us. The first figure is the true vine. By the way, those are the vines that need pruning. And as we understand the story, we get to the point that we recognize that Jesus is the vine. In the Old Testament, Israel was referred to as the vine or the vineyard of God. But it had come under God's judgment. It had come, gotten in a little bit of trouble because they ceased to obey fully everything that God had asked of them. And on this day, Jesus proclaims that he is the true vine, the faithful and the fruitful vine. And Jesus comes to fulfill the revelation of God as the very center of God's people. The vine is the picture of the exclusive source of life. 
and it's how the branches grow, and it's how fruit is produced. It only happens if you have the life that comes from the vine, which is Jesus Christ. We're able to understand these statements better today than the disciples did on the day they first heard it. We know now that the life, the death, the resurrection, the, the shedding of his blood, all of this that took place on Easter, between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, all of this is the source of life that he's talking about. When he says, I am the vine, I am giving life, we now understand this side of Easter that that life comes from him and from him alone and there's no other source of life even close to it. Jesus is the sole source of life for his people and true life can only be gained through the true vine. The second figure is that of the gardener and the gardener is God the Father. The Father is the planter, he's the cultivator of the vine, the overseer, the caretaker if you will. He's the one ultimately in charge of what gets pruned and what doesn't and how, how well things will grow in the vineyard. His desire is to see fruit produced on the vine. And though it may sound cruel, if you don't prune a vine, it actually ends up produ producing no fruit. And the goal of the father, of the gardener, of the caretaker, is lots of fruit. And then we have the third part of the picture. <clears throat> it's us. We are the branches. God's people are the branches that produce the fruit. The branches are necessary in order for the vine to be productive. But in order for them to bear fruit, they need to stay attached to the vine. And Jesus is very clear in explaining this fruit-producing principle when he said, He who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. That's a sobering statement, is it not? We think we're pretty good at some things. We think we, we can make certain things happen in a certain way at certain times. But the validity of that statement, the end of that statement that Jesus makes is something that every human being ought to hang on to. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And those of us who have tried it, those of us who have tried going it alone, we know the truth. That word is truth. Because somewhere along the way, you may make a little progress, but soon you're going to discover you can't make it by yourself. You've got to have his help. Apart from him, we do nothing. Remaining connected in order to produce fruit is just common sense. And I don't think the disciples were surprised by this statement in any way. I think they understood it. I think they, excuse the, the term, connected with it. And they understood the importance of staying connected. Fruit bearing is the result of remaining in Christ and Christ remaining in us. So how does it work? How does it work out? How does it play out in the life of a disciple? Well, there, there is more to this passage that I want you to pay attention to. There are some things that Jesus includes in this passage of being connected that we need to watch carefully. For instance, the, one of the benefits of staying connected is producing fruit. Obvious, but in verse 5, remaining will cause you to grow in holiness. You become not just a branch, but a fruit-producing branch. What are the fruit of the Spirit? <clears throat> Can you name them? Let's name them together. Love, joy, peace. Very good. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit produces the character of Jesus Christ in the life of a believer. And part of what we're looking for in the, the life of a disciple is fruit that is Christ-like. We're looking for Christ-likeness. We're looking for disciples who are growing and becoming more like Jesus Christ in every way. How is it working for you? How is it happening in your life? It will not happen accidentally. It won't. 
It will not happen by accident. It will only take place by design. And whatever the rhythm is and whatever is right for you and whatever fits your personal schedule and your learning capacity and your learning techniques, use that. If, if first thing in the morning is what's right for you, have your devotions and your discipleship time in the morning. If it's in, in the middle of the morning, if it's at noon, if it's in the afternoon, if it's in the evening, whatever fits for you, but by all means, have a plan and work the plan at strengthening your walk as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And watch for the fruit to grow. And lack of fruit should be a sign that more needs to be done. So the first thing that we learn is that there is fruit, but the second result of remaining in an unbroken relationship with Jesus Christ is love. We love that word. But I'm not talking about loving lunch at a certain restaurant or loving an activity. I'm talking about a love for God and a love for his people. I'm talking about the greatest commandment, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and the second greatest commandment, loving your neighbor as yourself. Our Lord wants us in an ongoing, lifelong, loving relationship with him, and he says, just as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. You see, here's, here's what we need to understand about this passage. God takes pride in his vineyard. God takes pride in his vineyard. And we are part of the vineyard, therefore God takes pride in us. He loves us. He cares about us. He may do some things to us in the pruning process that seem a little uncomfortable, but the end result is tremendous. More fruit is produced if we let the master gardener do the work he needs to do. He considers you a prized possession. He has committed himself to caring and providing for you. Why? Because you belong to him and you're part of his vine. <clears throat> the third aspect that, that staying connected produces is obedience. Actually, this is another way of staying connected. Some people understand living in obedience to be rather difficult. But consider this. Obedience is the natural outflow of love. Anybody here in love? Anybody here in love with another human being? Yeah, a few of you confessed. A few of you are about to get an elbow in the gut. You should have raised your hand quicker, men. What is one of the outflowing aspects of love? Obedience. Yes, dear. Whatever you say, dear. Well, maybe not quite like that. But obeying is not a duty or an obligation when the motivation is love. And, and there are those who think that God put these commands in our way to interrupt our personal freedom. How many times have you heard it said by someone who just doesn't want to be an all-in follower of Jesus Christ? Well... I can go so far, but, but some of those commands he puts out there, some of those requirements that are put on us, those are just too much. They interfere with my personal freedom and my personal desires and my personal want to. That person is not in love with Jesus Christ. That person has not discovered what it means to be in a living, loving relationship with our Lord. Because obedience is the outflow of, of true love and falling in love with Jesus Christ will not make his commands seem cumbersome but rather it will make them well let's put it to you this way has anybody here ever seen a two-year-old without its parents around to give constructive criticism and guidance hmm what goes on you're laughing April what goes on they're just everywhere. They're all over everything. They're into everything. Without any guidance, without any guidelines, without any structure, mom and dad are out of the way and out of the picture and out of sight and out of mind, and therefore I'm free. 
And the people around a two-year-old that is out of control are saying, where is mom and dad? A person who calls themselves a disciple who lives out of control and thinking they're out of sight and outside the regulations and outside the rules that God has put upon us, put in front of us, the guiding, the, gui the guardrails, if you will, that person is just out of control and in trouble. Those guidelines, those guardrails are there for a purpose and there for a reason, and they are to help us. And living in obedience keeps us inside the guardrails. Living in obedience keeps us in a protected area, keeps us in a safe area, keeps us in a zone where, where we are better able to function and better able to understand what God is wanting to do in our lives. When we are truly connected to the vine, there is an inner desire to do as much as we can to demonstrate our love for Him. And obeying His commands becomes something we desire rather than something we do from a heart of duty. When we consider how much He loves us, when we consider all that He's done for us, the only appropriate response is to love Him in return. With all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, and even with all of our finances. Verse 10 says, If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. Obedience is a result of being attached forever to Christ and His love. The last result of remaining in the true vine of Jesus Christ is joy. Verse 11, the last verse we read said, There's a reason I've told you this. I've told you this, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. The word complete means fill to the brim. Now, that can be a, a coffee cup. That can be a five-gallon bucket. That can be a 55-gallon drum. Whatever it is that fits your imagination best right now. It means fill to the brim so that you may have joy to the the maximum to the fullest if we put in, if he puts any more joy in it's going to drip over the side fill to the brim that's the kind of joy he wants you to have and that's the kind of joy that is only available as we stay connected in the vine you do understand the difference between joy and happiness do you not happiness is dependent on circumstances if it rains a certain day and gets your hair wet, ladies, that's not a good day. But that has to do with happiness and unhappiness. Some of you guys don't worry about that because there's no hair to get wet. That has to do with happiness because that has to do with circumstances. Joy is deeper than that. And probably the best living example I ever had of joy was back in seminary. He was six foot six, two inches taller than I am, but never stood up to be taller than me because he was bound as a quadriplegic to a wheelchair. One of my seminary friends, Dick McCool, Dick had been through undergraduate work at Olivet Nazarene University and then had come to Kansas City to complete the master's of ministry degree. Good guy. But as a high school student, had gone to the lake one day, a lake he had been swimming in many times before, dove off a wharf, a, a dock, and the water was lower than normal, and when he dove in, he hit the bottom, snapped his neck, and was paralyzed from the, from the neck down for the rest of his life. But Dick felt the call to ministry. I don't know that there's anybody I've ever been around with any more joy in their life than this man who was a quadriplegic. Maneuvered with an electric wheelchair into a van. Anybody remember the original Mission Impossible series on TV 120 years ago? You remember the big van they had? 
the big box van. That's what Dick had for his vehicle. It was rigged where you could drive it with your hand. You didn't have to have your feet on the pedals. They had specially designed it where forward was more gas, back was less gas, down was brake, and I can't remember the others, but I did get to drive it a time or two. He would push a button and the back doors would swing open and a lift would let down and the, raise the wheelchair into the lift and roll up to the front and take his place in the driver's seat. And Dick also improved my prayer life on the weeks I rode with him to seminary when he was driving. But I said, Dick, where, where did the call come from? He said, Ken, I had the call before I had the accident. And he said, I couldn't let the accident interfere with my call. I said, well, how do you see it playing out? He said, oh, God's already made that clear. I'm going to be a hospital chaplain. I said, interesting. As much time as you've spent in a hospital, you now want to spend more time in a hospital on a regular basis. He said, exactly. He said, you walk into a hospital room and see a patient, and they say, oh, a pastor's here. I walk into a hospital room in a wheelchair and I don't have to say anything. The message is already sent. And he said, my job is to bring the joy of the Lord into a place where there seems to be no joy. There definitely many times is no happiness. But I get to bring the joy of the Lord in. I said, Dick, tell me, tell me where your joy comes from. I said, you're limited to a chair for the rest of your life. You're, <clears throat> you're limited in so many ways. And he was part of our single adult ministry at, at College Church in Olathe. Hardly ever late. Always brought two or three extra wheelchairs with him. And let the rest of us figure out how to ride a wheelchair on two wheels while he sat and laughed at us. He said, my joy comes from knowing that I'm making a difference in the name of the Lord. My joy doesn't come from my circumstances. My joy doesn't come from my, my limitations. My joy comes from knowing that God can still use me in spite of my handicap. He said, by the way, Ken, you've got handicaps too. I said, thanks for pointing that out. He said, no, I'm serious. He said, everybody has them. In one way or another, we're limited. We're held back. But he said, it's understanding that Jesus Christ can work through the difficult parts of your life to make a difference. In fact, he, I'll never forget it. <clears throat> he said, what Paul wrote is true. God can do more in my weakness than he can in my strength. Jesus said, I've told you this so that you might have joy and might have it to the brim. What is the joy level of your life today? I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. God wants to produce fruit in you and through you. How's it going? It's springtime. Time for pruning. Time for getting ready to see the fruit begin to blossom and become pollinated and grow. The harvest will come later in the year. How's it going? How are things in the fruit-producing business of your life? Would you stand together? Father, we know your desire for us. Your desire is that we might have a relationship with you that is everlasting. I pray that's true for every person here today. But I also believe that you allow us to do a checkup along the way. And this morning... There's been some soul searching. There's been some opportunity for 
the Holy Spirit to check the lives of some individuals. I pray that you would fill us with your love, that you would produce your fruit through us, that you would help us to become more obedient than we've ever been before, and that you would allow there to be joy unspeakable in our hearts and lives. As we go from this place, may we understand that we do not get away from you, but that you walk with us. You're with us every step of the way. May your will be done. May your presence be acknowledged. May your power be unleashed within us to do more for you than we've ever done before in this coming week. And for all that you do, for the ways that you help, for the difference that you make in our lives, we will thank you and praise you. For we ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all the people said, Amen. He just shared it with us. Love the Lord with all your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Sing it out. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. I will serve the Lord. I will serve the Lord. With all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. With all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul. With all my strength. Repeat after me. With all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. I will love you, Lord, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. I hope that's your goal this morning. Have a seat real quick. Hey, Jennifer Hunt is coming to share with us. There's a big thing. We only let Jennifer Hunt speak when there's big things coming up. When it's smaller things like budgets and stuff, we let her husband talk. But when it's big stuff for the women's ministry, it's Jennifer Hunt. So how, how about a nice hand for Jennifer Hunt? She's our new women's ministry director. Is that what you're called? That's what I'm calling you. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for letting me come up here, Aaron. I appreciate that. 
Um, to this Tuesday night, we have a big event. It's an annual event we do every year. It's our spring banquet, and it's just for the ladies. And I just want to encourage you guys that we still have room. If you have not signed up yet, we are going to have a table out here after church um, for you to sign up. Um, if you didn't bring your checkbook, don't worry. You can just sign up today, and you can pay on Tuesday. It's a $10 fee, and that includes a delicious dinner Sue has provided, or she's, she's going to cook for us. And she need, we need to know how many are coming. Um, she's going to start shopping tomorrow. So if you can let us know either right after service or um, this, this afternoon, uh, we, we have a place for you. We're excited about this um, event. It's uh, Proverbs 31 Woman is the theme. And um, it's just going to take us, uh, it's a picture of a woman that lives a truly a beautiful life. And we just want you guys to come, enjoy yummy food. Um, there's going to be door prizes. There's going to be little gifts at your table. So you're going to come home with yummy, full bellies. You're going to have a nice little gift to take home, and you're going to be spiritually encouraged by the message that evening. We're going to have song. We're going to have beautiful music. Um, Robin Stallings is going to speak. Um, so it's just going to be a great evening. Um, so please plan to come and invite your friends. Thank you so much. And half of us are wondering why we can't come. Full bellies. We need to be encouraged, too. What's up with that? Come on. We invited you to the Wow Game Dinner this past year. I'm getting indignant now. Sue, just fix me dinner, and I'll be, I'll be happy. Next Sunday night, next Sunday night, the Jim Brady Trio is going to be with us at 6.30. That's going to be a fun night. The choir is going to sing, um, and, and they're going to be sharing with us. They're wonderful. They're wonderful. If you don't, if you don't believe me... Um, Come, and, and then you can argue with me later. But until then, you come and, and be a part of that. Bring your friends. It's going to be, it's going to be a great night, 6.30. No tickets required. If you don't care for the music, you get all your money back. This Thursday is the National Day of Prayer, and there's a service over at Walnut Street Baptist Church at 6.30. Our pastor takes part in that. And um, so come on out to that and support our community effort with that. And then right now, not now, 2 o'clock this afternoon. There is Sundays on Sunday is what we're calling it. And it is for all the Sunday school teachers. Who else is it for, Pastor? Anyone who likes ice cream or just Sunday school teachers? And it's going to be over in the Family Life Center at 2 o'clock. So um, that, that, that's your dessert. They're, they're serving you that. So go to lunch and come back and eat, eat your dessert. And they're going to have some inspiring words. There's no dinner from Sue this time. I'm sorry. But you can come back and be inspired. But there, there's some things that the uh, Sunday school department needs to share with everybody, so, uh, all the Sunday school teachers. So pl please plan on being there. Thank you so much. I guess that means I'm done. Get your cup of coffee. Go to Sunday school. Have a great day. Thank you for being here.